Okay, I, I first would like to thank all of you for coming to this. This is actually a much greater attendance than I anticipated. Uh, I don't know if I'll go a full 90 minutes, but this will be a somewhat lengthy pre presentation on understanding corneal tomography. Now, most of the course, in fact, really all of it, is going to deal with the Oculus Penicam, but the, but the concepts are really pertinent to any Scheinflug device and or pretty much any OCT device. Some of the software that I'll describe is inherent to the Pentacam, but again, the properties uh, really are pertinent to any tomographic device. So before I get started, I'd just like to show of hands, how many of you routinely use a placebo-based imaging in your practice? How many of you use some degree, some form of tomographic system, whether it's Scheinflug or OCT? So actually, a few years ago, the numbers would have been re reversed with Placido being much more popular. It was actually very few hands here had Placido compared to tomography. And as we start off, I'm gonna kind of start off with what the difference is between an elevation-based system and a curvature-based system. And I've been for many, actually, over two decades, a big proponent of elevation-based imaging. Um, I am a consultant for Oculus. I also a consultant for Avidro and uh, a, another cross-linking company. I do not receive any funds for any of my displays or software that I developed. And this is what most people think about that. So we're going to start a little, as I said, with a, a background, the difference between tomography and topography. We're then going to basically concentrate on some keratoconic and cross-linking displays and how we can use them in clinical practice. So as I said, before we really discuss anything, we need to understand how elevation and curvature differ, because there are some major inherent differences between the two, and I like to use analogies. Curvature is analogous to measuring a spectacle lens power on a lensometer. All of us use lens lensometers. It is extremely accurate. If I give all of you the same pair of glasses and give you and tell you to measure our lensometer, you'd all come back basically giving me the exact same reading as long as you know how to use a lens lensometer. It's very accurate, but it tells us nothing about the shape of the lens. We all know that I can have multiple different lens shapes that will give us the same power reading on a lensometer. Okay, the same thing, I'll say it again. Multiple different lenses you can see here. All these are plus four lenses. All these are minus four lenses. If I put them in a lensometer, you all will come back and give me the same reading, but none of you would be able to tell me whether it was this, this, or this if it was a minus four lens. Power reading on a lensometer tells us nothing about the shape of the, of the lens itself. And that's very similar to curvature measurements of the cornea. We're led to believe that when we measure curvature, when we're measuring shape, and we are not. We're measuring basically the curvature. It doesn't tell us much about the shape. Now, this is also true. For those of you who have an astigmatic pair of glasses, you know that if you tilt your glasses, you change the power. So power is related to the ori orientation of the lens. So we say here, curvature and power will change with orientation. Lens tilt or change in measurement axis will alter that measurement in the, lens, in the lensometer. So the same lens, here we showed you earlier, different shapes give you the same power. Here we're saying the same lens can have multiple different powers based on its orientation. And again, as I said, for those of you who have spectacle glasses and you tilt them, you will know that's, that's true. And that's true with curvature also. We think curvature as being inherent shape property, but it's not. Things like inferior steepening, which many people in the past considered the hallmark of early ectatic change, can be seen in completely normal eyes. So inferior steepening IS values are late signs of disease and will be seen in patients with keratoconus, but they can also be seen in normal patients. And they really are a very poor screening. Most of you would look at this map here, which is a curvature map, 
And the first thing you would think about is this is an ectatic cornea. So I want to show you a study that we did. So this is an astigmatic test object. Here we have it with no tilt, effectively zero degree angle capper. Here we have, I think it's five or six degrees, which is still considered physiologically normal. And here we have something that's outside the physiological range. It's 10 degrees angle kappa. And if you look at these three maps, they all look pretty much the same. And in the past, this type of testing was done. And people would go, well, really, tilting doesn't really affect the eye. And curvature is very good because these all look normal, even though you're putting tilt. Well, the limitation of the was really the limitation of testing. This is an astigmatic test object. Now, this is the exact same testing done on an astigmatic, aspheric test object. Zero degree, notice what happens here, notice what happens here. On an aspheric test object, an astigmatic aspheric, when you give, again, normal degrees of angle kappa here, we generate an asymmetric bow tie with inferior steepening. The human cornea, however, is aspheric. This is not keratoconic cornea. It's a normal cornea with, an, with a decentration, an angle capper, an elevation. We call it a displaced apex, and I'll show you later why we call it a displaced apex. But it's basically the same analogy I showed you earlier with an astigmatic spectacle. When you tilt it, you change the power. Here is an astigmatic cornea, and it has to, it's an aspheric, it's a human cornea that if you tilt it, or you don't really tilt it, the patient inherently has tilt, their line of sight isn't the corneal apex, that's angle kappa, you can develop in what looks like classic inferior steepening on a completely normal eye. So again, I don't want you to think that curvature really conveys shape, it does not. So these are all normal eyes. Here you can see a completely normal symmetric bow tie, but notice here, we have what looks like an asymmetric bow tie. Now, for those of you who are familiar with looking at a lot of curvature maps, you'll notice the principal meridians are still orth orthogonal. And that should be a hint to you that this is a false positive. So again, inferior steepening, significant inferior steepening, but again, orthogonal principal meridians. The same thing you will see here. Inferior steepening, and this is well beyond what most people quote as 1.4 or 1.6 diopters of inferior steepening, but again, normal principal meridians. These are normal eyes. So these are all curvature false positives. And here I will show you as a composite both a, a pachymetric map, a curvature map, and then both anterior and posterior ele elevation maps. Here, and this is the same patient, this is a right and left, left eye. Here you'll notice what looks like a completely normal curvature map symmetric bow tie. For those of you, and I'll explain how to read an elevation map later, but this is a normal ele elevation map, also of an astigmatic pattern, a normal pachymetric map, and this is posterior, again, a normal astigmatic. But notice the curvature map on, on this eye. It's significant inferior steepening. Well, if you look at the elevation map, it looks just like this one, but it looks like it's been pulled down, it's been tilted. And that's exactly why it's still a normal elevation astigmatic pattern, but it causes a inferior steepening on curvature. So you can pick up that it's a normal line elevation. It just looks like it's been tilted. We call this a displaced apex. Here, this is the apex here, and notice in this side, the apex is displaced downward. So a displaced apex is a term we, we call, and when you see that, you will, off, you will, will almost always see an asymmetric bow tie pattern, but it's a normal eye. It's an eye with an angle kappa, which is very, very common. So elevation data represents true shape. Within physiologic range, it's independent of axis, orientation, or positioning. Now, if you purposely position someone well outside of the normal range, it won't look normal, but within normal range, that we normally see in, in, in the clinic, elevation represents true shape. All subsequent maps, and elevation maps can generate curvature maps, all, all subsequent maps derived from an accurate elevation will be accurate. 
from those of you who want the mathematical modeling, curvature is the second derivative of elevation. How many of you actually remember any of your cal calculus? No one. Anybody? Okay, well, derivatives are unique. In other words, if you have a formula, there's only one solution to, a, to get a derivative. Going the other way, which is an integral, have multiple solutions. So elevation will generate curvature. Curvature cannot generate elevation without making certain assumptions. So again, it's an integral going backwards, and there are multiple different solutions to that. So how do some Placido systems generate ele elevation data? Well, they have to make an assumption about shape, and the assumption they make is that the eye follows standard spheroidal cylindrical optics. So they, they do a reasonably good job in normal eyes, but they do a very poor job in abnormal eyes because an abnormal eye, like a keratoconic eye, doesn't follow normal spheroidal cylindrical optics. So again, elevation maps can generate curvature maps and they will be highly accurate, but the other way does not hold true. So again, I'm gonna show you Scheinflug, but this is very similar to OCT also. These are optical cross-sections. And the advantage of whether it's OCT or Scheinflug as opposed to a reflective system is a reflective system only looks at the anterior surface. A reflective system is also limited to only looking at best about 60% of the anterior surface. The reason for that is two twofold. First, you cannot design a placido cone that will encompass the entire cornea. The, the anatomy of the orbit and the nose prevents that. The other reason is it is impossible to bounce light off the peripheral cornea and have it come back to a central camera. So you all know in a placido system, it's a series of rings. There's a camera right in the middle. It shoots a picture and takes a picture of itself. Well, in order to do that, you have to be able to bounce light off the cornea and back into the receiving camera. And it does that by curving the cone. So if you think back you know, 200 years ago, the original Placido disc was a disc, it was a flat surface, and it really only imaged maybe central three millimeters. And then they made curved cones, smaller cones that they can fit into the orbit more and curve to try to get the light to bounce back into the camera. But at best, you can only really image about 60% of the corneal surface. You'll notice here on a dilated eye on a Scheinflug, we're actually imaging almost limbus to limbus. So you'll notice here, this is the anterior surface in red. This is the posterior, and again, it uses image detection. Here's the anterior lens, and here's the posterior lens, which you normally would only do in a, in a highly di dilated eye. But if you're able to identify these four surfaces, you can generate anterior elevation, anterior curvature. You can generate posterior elevation and posterior curvature by looking at the spatial relationship between the anterior and posterior data, you can develop a full pack, pachymetric map. If you can read the posterior cornea and the anterior lens, you can measure anterior chamber depth, and most of the time you're not gonna be able to really to image all the way on the post posterior lens without dilating the patient, but you can determine lens thick, thick, thickness. Additionally, because it is a light cross-section, they, they can determine dense, dense, densiometry, which is how dense or non-opaque the cornea is and also, also the lens. So as I already said, elevation can derive, and here we're looking at anterior curvature. So again, it's just a second derivative of ele elevation. Here is the ele elevation map, and I'll, I'll again explain how we generate an ele elevation map. Here is the posterior elevation, and here is corneal thickness map, and again, the corneal thickness map is just, as I said, the spatial difference between the anterior elevation data and the posterior elevation data. And as I already alluded to, you can't do this with a curvature map. Curvature cannot generate ele elevation. The analogy I, I use is like the speedometer in a car versus a GPS device in a car. A GPS device knows where you are every point in time. All of you have G, G, most of you have GPS in your car, correct? Some of you do? Okay. Well, it tells you where you're going, how to get there, but it knows exactly where you are every point in time, but it also tells you how fast you're going. So if it knows every point in time, it can determine speed. 
Your speedometer does the same thing, but the speedometer can't tell you where you're going or where, or where you are. And that's kind of curvature versus ele elevation. The speedometer can only tell you where you are if you don't deviate from a certain line. If, if you say, I'm going straight, it can deduce that. But that's the same thing with curvature. It works very well as long as you don't deviate from normal spherocylindrical optics. But again, if all we were looking at were normal eyes, we wouldn't need any of this. So for abnormal eyes, for keratoconic eyes, for post-LASIK eyes, for any ab abnormality, curvature is very, very limited, or placido-based curvature is very, very limited. So we'll start off now as kind of just an introduction of how elevation and curvature differ. So we now want to show you how we display elevation data. And you'll hear a lot of people, and I'll, I'll, I'll do the same, we'll say this is an, a front elevation map, this is a back elevation map. Really, we are never really showing you what is really an elevation map. These are true elevation maps. So this was a system I helped develop probably 25 years, years ago. It was not a commercial success. It's no longer available. But it was one of the first systems to actually measure true elevation on, on the cornea. And this is a normal eye. This is an eye with mild keratoconus. This is an eye with advanced keratoconus. And the first thing that you'll notice, if you look at all three of these, is they look all about the same. And that's the problem. These actual, what we call, raw elevation maps are not clinically useful. And if you think about it, if I take anybody, no matter how bad their cornea is abnormal, lie them down on the black and back and have them look up to the ceiling, the center of the cornea is still going to be the high point. I don't care how bad the cone is, the center is pretty much always going to be the high point. And you look at this very advanced keratoconus here, the map looks very similar to this. So that we need a way to show you elevation data that makes it clinically useful, or you can look at the map and, and basically gather clinically useful information. And we'll show you what's normally done. This is the same system done by every system, whether it's OCT or Shine Flute. But remember, this is really what the machine sees. This is what everything is generated from. It's just that this is not information that we can look at visually and inspect. So how is elevation data displayed? Okay. The most common method is to display it against a best fit sphere to that surf surface. And traditionally, we use the central eight millimeters. You can use anything. And I'll say right off the bat, many machines, actually every machine offers multiple different, quote, reference surfaces to compare to. And I'll show you some examples later. You can use a best fit sphere. You can use an ellipse. You can use a toric ellipse. You can use a best fit toric ellipse. You can use something which we'll describe later, which is an enhanced reference surface. The reference surface will change the appearance of the map, will change the elevation data, has nothing to do with accuracy. If you look at a, take a building outside, you can measure the height of that building from the, from the sidewalk. You can measure it from the basement, which is the total length of the construction. You can measure it from sea level. They'll all give you different numbers. They don't affect accuracy. So you'll hear a lot of people will say, well, using a toric ellipse is more accurate than a sphere. It, nothing, none of that's correct. None of that has anything to do with accuracy. It has to do with, it'll change the appearance of the map. And the reason why we use a best fit sphere, which I'll show you later, is that the maps are inherently the easiest to visualize. So again, it's not an accuracy ish issue. The other thing to be aware is that a lot of published data, which will tell you whether something is normal or not, is dependent on that reference surface. In other words, if you measure a building, but everyone is measuring it off the sidewalk and someone else is measuring it off of sea level, they're both correct, as I said, but you can't tell which building is taller if someone is measuring from sea level and someone is measuring from the sidewalk or the basement. So in general, the pretty much standard nowadays is to use an eight millimeter central optical zone to determine your best fit sphere. The reason we determined on that 8.0 millimeter was the normal eye is aspherical. We all know that. So it's steeper in the center and flatter in the periphery. 
So actually, I'm going to jump to that in a second. Let me go back and go back to this picture we have here. And that is, how do we, how do we display ele elevation? As I said, we use to display the raw elevation data against a best fit sphere. And if we look at here, a flat meridian will be raised over that best fit sphere, and the steep meridian will fall below the best fit sphere. And we generate a pattern that looks like this, which is a normal elevation astigmatic pattern. The blue represents here the flat meridian. The red represents here the steep meridian. And we can see it again on a, on a picture here. So the steep profile falls below the best fit sphere. The flat profile rises above the best fit sphere. And this is what we get in an absolutely normal astigmatic pattern. Now, very often, I will have people send me maps and say, well, I have a, a number of plus 23. Is this normal or abnormal? Well, here it's minus 23. The first thing you should do when you look at an elevation map is just look at the pattern. Ignore the numbers. If the pattern is normal, it's normal. Okay? These numbers here represent the amount of the astigmatism and how far you are from the apex. So if I back up a picture here, you'll notice right at the apex, the steep and flat meridian meet. So it's zero difference. As we go further away from the apex, notice how they separate, and notice how they get further away from that best fit sphere. So if we go back to this picture, you'll notice it's zero right here. And regardless of what meridian you take, as you go further away from the center, the numbers increase they will increase faster with the greater the amount of the astigmatism. So if you have an eye with zero astigmatism, it stays zero throughout the whole thing. If you have an eye with a high amount of astigmatism, those two numbers, those two flat and steep meridians separate faster and these numbers will be greater. So the numbers just signify the magnitude of the astigmatism and how far you are from the apex. They don't in itself indicate pathology as long as the pattern is normal. And again, this is a normal astigmatic pattern. Okay, so just going to open up. Uh, we have lots of time to open up for questions before I get on to the keratoconic shape. And don't hesitate to ask a question. Anybody at all? Okay, so I want you then to compare this normal astigmatic pattern to this pattern. Now, this pattern is a true patient. It's a very unusual, because you normally won't see a picture this clear, but this is what we call a positive island of elevation <coughs> surrounded by a sea of blue. And this is what we look for when we're looking for ectatic disease. Now, clearly, this picture looks dramatically different than this picture. So again, this is what we call a positive island surrounded by a sea of blue. And that is what you will see in an ectatic cornea. Now, why do we get this type of picture? Well, I showed you before how we get that normal astigmatic pattern. Well, this is how we get the keratoconic pattern. Okay. So again, notice, I want you to notice a positive island here. Notice this is all negative here. We call this a sea of blue. And notice where the greatest negative numbers are. They're in the mid periphery here. They're not out in the far periphery. And notice right over here, now this is not a color scale that I normally recommend you using, but I did it for a specific reason. That's the green, that narrow green is zero. Notice they have, we have a little circle of green surrounding that positive island. Why do we get that? So let's look at a cone. And again, normal eyes aren't gonna be a pure cone, but if we take a, a conical shape and we fit a best fit sphere to that shape, notice what happens. We truncate the top of the cone right here, positive, right? And the highest points right in the middle, which is what you see here. Notice where the most negative values are relative to this best fit sphere. It's not in the periphery. It's in this mid area here, which corresponds to this dark blue here. And notice what happens in this little narrow band here that's the transition from plus to minus. That's the narrow green point here. So this is why a cone, when compared to a best fit sphere, 
will give you this picture. Again, we call it a po positive island of elevation surrounded by a sea of blue. This is what we look for when we're screening patients for ectatic disease. The difficulty is it will never be this easy to see. And the reason for that is most patients with keratoconus also have one other thing and has lots of astigmatism. So these positive islands are superimposed on an astigmatic pattern. And I'll show you those examples later. But this was a true patient that has a huge cone with very little cylinder. And that gives us this very pure picture of a positive island surrounded by a sea of blue. The other advantage, again, of whether it's Scheinflug or OCT, and but basically changing again from a reflective system to an optical cross-section, is our ability to look at both the anterior but also the posterior surface. And without being able to look at the posterior surface, which you can't on a reflective system, you can't generate a full pack pachymetric map, and you can't determine when the posterior surface is abnormal, and we'll show you later that the posterior surface is the early indicator of pathology. You will see changes on the posterior surface before you see any changes on the anterior surface. So let's look at a couple of examples of that. And again, I already told you that almost always going to be looking at these for positive islands, but they're going to be superimposed on an astigmatic pattern. So this is an anterior elevation map, again, shown against the best fit sphere. And you'll notice it's an astigmatic pattern, but you'll notice there's a lack of a lot of colors. And the reason for that is it's not a lot of astigmatism. If you remember, I showed you, if you go way back here, to this picture, you saw 23, 23, 23, 25, because there was a lot of astigmatism. If you look at this picture that I was showing you, that's because I'm going the wrong way. If you look now, you'll notice these numbers are much lower. Here it's 7, here it's 12, so much smaller because, again, there's less astigmatism. But notice again, it's a normal astigmatic pattern. If you look at the curvature map, it looks almost spherical, very little difference again, because it's a very low astigmatic. But look at this posterior ele elevation map. Here again is an astigmatic pattern, but notice what you see here. We, again, this is a positive island of elevation. This is a posterior ectasia. This is an abnormal, this is a keratoconic cornea, but it's what we call subclinical keratoconus. It's not form first, which is a term I don't like, or suspect. This is true disease. This is a patient who has keratoconus that has a normal anterior surface, has normal visual acuity, but a posterior ectasia. For those of you who are, can, can kind of look at this, it's hard to tell because the colors don't show well on the screen, but the thinnest point is also displaced on the pachymetric map to correspond to this posterior ectasia. It's just hard really to see because I don't think the colors show up well uh, on, on, on the screen. So again, this shows you the advantage of being able to image both the anterior and posterior surface. This is a patient who's one, asymptomatic, and B, if you image with a placido system, would look completely normal. This is a patient, one, who's not a candidate for refractive surgery, who does have keratoconus, and as we'll show you later, if this continues to progress, would be an appropriate candidate to intervene with cross-linking in spite of the fact that they may be asymptomatic. Here's another example again, and the placement of the maps are somewhat different, but again, look at the curvature map here. It looks very, very normal. Here you can see the beginning of a positive island on the anterior surface, but look at the prominent positive island on the posterior surface. So again, the value of being able to image not just the anterior surface, but the posterior sur surface. Another example here, look at the curvature, completely normal. Again, here's the anterior elevation, a completely normal pattern, but a real prominent posterior ectasia. Again, it's an astigmatic pattern with this positive island of elevation superimposed on, this ele on the astigmatic pattern. So again, this is what you look for. This is true, true disease. Now, if you look at the pachymetric map, it looks fairly normal, and notice the thinnest point is pretty much in the center of the pupil. The reason for that is 
the posterior ectasia is pretty much in the center of the pupil. So this is a central cone. It just happens to be on the posterior surface. So now I talked to you, or I mentioned earlier that you can use almost any reference surface, and that's true. The reference surface, as I said, doesn't affect the accuracy. It will clearly change the appearance of the map. So the best fit sphere conveys not the most accurate information, but the easiest intuitive qualitative information. In other words, it's the easiest map to look at and make a really rapid di di diagnosis. The differences I already alluded to are only qualitative, that all the maps are generated from the same raw ele elevation data. It doesn't matter how you display it. One system isn't any more accurate than the other. It's all from that same raw elevation data that I showed you. So why do we use a best fit sphere? So here I'm going to show you maps comparing using a best fit sphere, an, elli an ellipsoid surface, a toric, a fixed toric ellipsoid, and a best fit toric ellipsoid. And these will not be mild cases. For those of you who are jumping the gun who are familiar with the Bell and Ambrosia display, this is the typical patient we're, we're going to show you. These are advanced cones. Okay, so it shouldn't be very, it should be very easy. So again, this is a sphere. This is an ellipsoid. This is a fixed toric ellipsoid. And this is a best fit toric ellipsoid. Now, if you had to do quick screening, which of these four would be the easiest to pick up that positive island of ele ele elevation? So it's very easy to see here. It's pretty easy to see here. Notice this, however, is even darker red. It's, it's more separation. But they're fairly masked over here. And why, why is that? Well, if you think about it, if you're looking for a cone, you don't want to compare it to a conical surface because a conical surface will fit the cone. We want to do something to separate the cone from the reference surface so it looks abnormal. Well, look abnormal. We want to maximize our ability to make a visual inspection. And it's like taking a red balloon. If you want to pick out the red balloon, you don't put it in a room that's painted red. So a toric ellipsoid will fit a cone better. But that's not what we're trying to do. We're trying to give you a visual way of quickly identifying abnormalities. Here is another example. Again, this is a best fit sphere. This is the ellipse. This is the fixed toric ellipsoid and the best fit toric ellipsoid. And again, as you can see, as you go to a best fit toric ellipsoid, it really masks the cone. Again, it's accurate. There's nothing wrong with these maps. But if you have to make a visual inspection, this is clearly the easiest one to utilize. So is the best fit sphere the best reference surface? And we looked at a number of things, and we developed something that we call an enhanced reference surface. And the enhanced reference surface is part of the, what's called the bad display or the Bell and Am Ambrosia display. The two maps up here, this is anterior elevation using the standard best fit sphere. This is posterior elevation using a standard reference surface, standard best fit sphere. The two maps below it represent the same data, but using what we call an enhanced reference surface. And we'll show you what, what, that, what that is. So if we think about maps of the Earth, Okay, we all would have no difficulty finding Mount, Mount Everest if we looked at a topographic map, map of the Earth. So anyone throw out, what's the height of, height, height of Mount Ev Everest? Okay, now how about an American in feet? It's about 30,000 feet, you're right, okay? Now that's against what though? Sea level, right, is sea level a best fit sphere? No. If I used a best fit sphere for the Earth, what would happen to Mount Everest? It would, it would get shorter. Right. It wouldn't get shorter, but it would, it would be a, a, low, a lower number. Sea level is not a best fit sphere. Okay, I think there's only one or two places in the whole globe that are below sea level. The Dead Sea is below sea level, and maybe Death Valley. I think 
Very few. So, but if you did a best fit sphere to the globe, you would average out all the land, the seas, and the mountains, and Mount Everest would be much, much lower. So we, however, want to do something similar to what we do with topographic maps of the Earth because we're looking for the mountains. We're looking for the ectatic areas. But this is what we normally do. Okay, so if this is an ectatic cornea here, this is the cone, this is the best fit sphere. Okay, and this is the best fit sphere, and if this was, quote, Mount Everest, and we did a best fit sphere to the Earth, that would be the height of Mount Everest. It isn't really the full height, it's less. But we really would like to be able to compare not this shape, but something that mimics sea level more, because that would accentuate the mountains. So can we do something to get something more equivalent to sea level, because that would make the mountains stick up higher, would make, again, easier to make a visual ins inspection. So normally what I said is when we do a best fit sphere, we take all the data within the central eight millimeter zone. And I don't have slides on this, but the reason we picked an eight millimeter zone, so as I, I said earlier, the normal cornea is aspheric. So if I use the entire cornea as a reference surface, would I generate a, island of a positive island of ele elevation? So the answer is yes, because the cornea is aspheric. So if I use the entire cornea for a best fit sphere, what I would show is the normal asphericity of, of the cornea. But I don't want to be able, I don't want to do that because that would look like a positive ion level of elevation. The less I use, the steeper the reference surface. If I use a very small, let's say, three millimeter zone, the cornea in the three millimeter zone is steeper than the entire cornea. So as it turns out, just by trial and error, between 8.1 and 8 masked the normal aspherosity of the cornea. So that's why it was chosen for actually two reasons. One is, most tomographic systems, particularly the shine fluke ones, can easily image eight millimeters. And two is, between eight and 8.1, it masked the normal aspherosity of the cornea. So again, it's not an accuracy issue, but if every normal eye had a positive island, then you would have to really look at the map very closely and say, okay, but the elevation is above a certain number, that's abnormal, if it's below, it's normal. We want you to be able to make a rapid visual inspection. So by using eight millimeters, the normal aspherosity is masked. Does that make sense, people? Okay, so what we did is we took that same eight millimeter zone that we normally take, but we've excluded a, and it's, I say a three and a half millimeter diameter centered at the thinnest point. So the thinnest point is basically the area of the cone in an ectatic cornea. We say 3.5 just for a description. It's actually a dynamic number between three and four. It's actually more complicated than that. But for understanding what we do is, we've excluded a 3.5 millimeter zone surrounding the thinnest point. So it's an eight millimeter optical zone that we've removed data from the central 3.5 at the thinnest point, not at the apex, but at the thinnest point is that corresponds to where the cone is. And what we generate then is we've gone from this shape, and by removing the bulk of the cone, bulk of the conical, we generate a, a shape that more mimics true sea level. Or basically what we can imagine is we're fitting more to the more normal periphery of the cornea. So we change this shape to this shape. Just as importantly, when we do that on a normal eye, because normal eyes don't have conical regions, the change is very, very small. And I'll give you, again, a clinical example. So this looks like a fairly normal astigmatic pattern. This is that eight millimeter zone, that dotted line in here, that we're taking all the data from. But you'll notice right over here, and it does show up, actually it does show up well on your screen, better than on my laptop here. Notice it looks like a very small positive ion level of elevation. So this, it's something you probably can pick up, but when we use the enhanced reference surface, this maybe questionable area becomes very easy to see. And what do these lines mean? This circle here, right here, the dots, 
over here represent the eight millimeters. So everything inside there is that reference surface, the best fit sphere. Here, the enhanced reference surface, that same eight millimeter zone, but this circle here is the exclusion zone. We, we removed that data from the comp computation. That's just a pupil, that dot here. And notice that we change what looks like a very maybe hard to see or, or early thing to something much easier to visualize. So again, I want to stress it's not an accuracy issue. We do this to allow easier visual inspection. So let's look at an example here. This is the anterior elevation. Notice the island here using the standard best fit sphere. But notice here using the enhanced reference surface, much greater ele 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 elevation, much easier to see. Again, this is Mount Everest using a best fit sphere. It's much shorter. This is using sea level. Notice the posterior surface. None of us would miss that, but notice it goes from 60 to 80, 80, 87. So again, it further accentuates the pathology. Now, just as important that it accentuates the pathology is that we don't create false positives. And this is now a normal eye. Notice going from here, standard best fit sphere to enhanced, effectively no, no difference. And here's the back surface again. Notice going from here to here, effectively no change. So, and we, we did this on a fairly large study, and this has been published. Normalize showed, again, going from that standard best fit sphere to an enhanced reference surface. Normalize showed an average change at the apex of less than two microns, and keratoconic eyes showed a change of over 20 microns, so a huge difference. On the posterior surface, Normal eyes showed a change of less than three, and keratoconic eyes showed a change at the level of 40 microns. And these are p-values of 0, 0, 0, 1, so highly statistically significant. Graphically, which is probably easier to see, this is the, the change in elevation from the best fit sphere to the enhanced reference surface, anterior apex, and the maximal anterior change, posterior apex, and the maximal posterior change, you can see again how the abnormal eyes statistically are magnitudes greater. It turns out that that change in elevation going from the standard best fit sphere to the enhanced reference surface turns out to be highly diagnostic for keratoconic or ectatic corneas. So the other part, and I'll Back up now a number of slides. The other part of the bad display, this is the part I just kind of described. This again, anterior best fit sphere, posterior best fit sphere, anterior with the enhanced reference surface, posterior with the enhanced reference surface. The bottom ones are not maps. The bottom ones are the numerical change, okay? so. I've never liked the fact that they made these round because people think it's a map. You think of these two ones as, as this. This is effectively what that bottom one is showing you. It's the change in magnitude and again, highly diagnostic for ectatic disease. The other half of the display is pachymetric data. And the value, again, of whether it's Scheinpflug or OCT is the ability to generate not just a single apical corneal thickness reading, but a full corneal thickness map. And one of the things that you're able to generate if you have a full corneal thickness map, really more than one thing, but two things, one is the true thinnest point. And apical readings, particularly in keratoconic corneas, don't represent the thinnest point of the cornea. We all know that most cones are inferiorly displaced. So again, if you want to look at a true thinnest point, you do need a full pachymetric map. But the other thing it allows you to do is to generate what we call a pachymetric progression map. And that is determining the rate of change in corneal thick, thick, thickness. And why is that important? Well, we all know that you can have someone who comes into your office with a pachymetry of 480, that would be completely normal. You can also have someone who comes into your office with a thinnest pachymetry of 500 and have keratoconus. So let's look at an example here. These are two eyes that have identical central pachymetric readings, if all you had was an ultrasound. Okay, these two corneas 
have identical apical readings. And I'm just going to concentrate on the graph on the, on the lower part because it's much easier to explain and un un understand. This is called a PTI. It's percent thickness in increase. Think of it as the rate of change of corneal thick, thick thickening. Now, Renato Ambrosia from Brazil developed the right side of the display. I developed the left side. Um, Renato's from South, South America, and as you all know, people from the South America are backwards. So he developed this, something that I think is kind of counterintuitive. It's the rate of, rate of change of thickening. Most of us think of keratoconus as a thinning disorder, but this is a rate of change of thickening. So he starts at the thinnest point and goes out to the periphery. Now, in a keratoconic cornea, we'll have an abnormal thin where, where, the, where, where the cone is, but the periphery tends to be normal. So most cones have normal thickness in, in the far periphery. So the rate of change going from the thinnest point to the periphery is more rapid than you would normally see in a normal individual. So let's look at these two pictures here. These two, again, represent, they have the same central ap apical reading. If we look at the graph here, there's three lines, which you can't see, but I'll show you over here. There's three lines here. The upper and lower represent a 95% confidence interval in a normal population. The middle is just the mean, okay? And if you look at, if you look at this eye here, the red is the tracing of this patient. It's exactly down the center. So this is a normal pachymetric pro progression. This eye here has, that has the same apical reading. Look what happens to the tracing. Notice that it's below. So again, it's a little bit backwards, but below is a more rapid change. So if you look at this red tracing, it's well outside that 95% confidence interval. This is an eye that has a much more rapid change going from the thinnest point to the periphery. So this is an abnormal tracing. This is highly suggestive, again, of a keratoconic cornea. Now, look at these two eyes here and notice what's happening here in the tracing. Notice that's effectively above or flat. Notice here again how it goes above. Does anyone know when you would see, when you would see that? Someone yell something out. No, so you would see this in endothelial dysfunction or corneal edema. So when you have endothelial dysfunction, what part of the cornea thickens first usually? The center. So if you have someone with corneal decompensation, you lose the normal transition from thinness to the periphery. So this is what you'll see here, and you actually can look at the, the pachymetric map. It's all, almost all one, one color. So if you see a slight flattening, the, the, these are not sli slight, these, these are fairly advanced, but if you see a slight flattening of this PTI graph, it, sorry, if you see a, sli sli a slight flattening of the PTI graph, that usually is indicative of en endothelial failure or decompensation. So a lot of times you'll see a very normal map, but you'll notice a slight flattening. You should then look closely at the, en the endothelial cells. So again, the bad display, Bell and Ambrosia display, the left side is elevation data, both anterior and posterior surface. The right side is pachymetric data, and there's a number of other, uh, actually multiple other parameters that, that we utilize. So one of the original displays used five values in our regression analysis. We actually use nine values currently, but five values are shown on the bottom of the graph. They're labeled DF, which is the change in anterior elevation on the front surface. Again, it's that change from the best fit to the enhanced. DB is the change in the posterior elevation. DP is the pachymetric progression, what I just showed you. DT is the actual thinnest point on the cornea. And this is an old, old map. We don't actually use this parameter anymore but it's displacement of the thinnest point. We've added ART max, which is another pachymetric progression parameter. We also added the, an the absolute value of the anterior and posterior elevation at the thinnest point, and we added K max. I will tell you, K max is a terrible parameter, but people are so used to using it, they asked us to put it into the regression analysis. 
Each of these nine parameters are independently calculated based on established normal values. Each of these parameters, and here we're only showing five, but actually there are multiple throughout the display. Each of these are independently calculated, again, and they will turn yellow when they're more than, when they're 1.6 or greater standard deviations from the norm, and they'll turn red if they're 2.6 or greater standard deviations from the norm. A question I always get is, does that mean this patient's abnormal? The answer is no. Okay. Any single individual parameter has very little predictive value. And the analogy I always give people is a glaucoma an analogy. If someone walks into your office with a pressure of 22, technically that's outside the 1.6 standard deviation, so that would be flagged. They have a cup to disc of 0.1, a normal visual field, a normal nerve fiber layer, no, no family history, they don't have glaucoma. What they have is a pressure of 22. On the other hand, if someone comes in with a pressure of 20, 20 but if it is 0.9 cup abnormal field and drop of nerve fiber layer, they do have glaucoma. So a single value can't, is not pre predictive. So don't overread any of these in individual values. And because of that, you can go in and actually turn off the colors because some people don't like them for medical legal reasons. The only value that is predictive is the overall reading of the map, which is, again, based on a regression analysis of nine parameters. You cannot turn the color off on this one. So don't overread the individual parameters. You can very often see a single red or some, sometimes even two yellows and still have a completely normal, normal reading. So again, the final one is what you should utilize for basically determining whether the patient is normal or not. The bad display is not a keratocon keratoconus display. It's developed really as a refractive screening display to separate normal from abnormal. It's somewhat of a risk analysis for refractive surgery. It again is to separate normal from abnormal it is useful in looking at keratoconus, but it doesn't diagnose per se keratoconus. And does anyone know why? And no one's going to answer me, so I'll... Okay. It separates normal from abnormal. If someone comes in with Fuchs dystrophy and a pachymetry of 800, they will have a very abnormal bad display. It doesn't mean they have ectatic disease. It's designed, again, to allow you to do rapid visual screening for refractive surgery to separate normal from abnormal. So multiple, yes, if patient has keratoconus or early keratoconus, it will be abnormal, but if they have many other pathologies, it will also be abnormal. It's designed strictly to separate normal from abnormal and to give you basically a, an assistance in screening your, your patients. So let's look at the display, and again, again, here we can see here anterior elevation, best fit sphere, posterior elevation, best fit sphere, here against the enhanced reference, here against the enhanced reference, and notice the back is green, which the bottom is green, which means there's almost no difference, so the elevation maps here are all basically normal. Here you'll see a slightly high K-max of 47.8, which is why it's yellow. Here you'll see, uh, let me go down to here, a progression index and an ART max. These are, again, progression, pachymetric progression, and if you look at the tracing here, notice it's just slightly below that 95% confidence interval. So we have yellows on some of the pachymetric parameters, and we have a mildly abnormal final reading of 2.11, which is about two standard deviations outside the norm. So does this mean the patient has keratoconus? Not definitively. Does it mean they're at risk if you try to do refractive surgery? The answer is yes. And would this, screen, would this patient screen appropriately for refractive surgery? Most likely no, depending on the age of the patient and what procedure you're going to be doing. Here is an example again. Notice there's a single red parameter here, but notice the overall reading is completely normal. So again, I don't want you to overread 
any of the single parameters here. So how do you use display? So as I said already, you may have individual yellow or red, but the overall final D is within an ex acceptable range. And again, this is the one I just showed you before with a very f acceptable final D ratio, even though we have one red parameter. The, the display doesn't tell you what to do. No display should ever tell you what to do. You need to look at multiple things in addition to looking at the display, the age of the patient, the ablation depth, family history. It's to aid in your screening and decision-making process. With that, people always ask me, and I would love you not to photograph this slide, because some of it is based on nothing other than just what I, what I do. So what are my general LASIK guidelines? I rarely do refractive surgery on patients less than 21 years, and mind you, practice patterns will vary greatly depending on where you are in the world and what country you're on. Uh, I rarely do my patients less than 21 unless needed for occupational reasons. I do not do LASIK, and again, this is really limited to where you live because thickness readings will vary on, on different pop population bases. So like in Asia, they have thinner corneas than you do, do in the U.S. I do not do LASIK with thinnest pre-op pachymetry below 495. I will tell you that is based on zero data. That's just what I do, okay? I look at thinnest reading, not apical reading. So it's always important that I look, when I do my residual bed computations, everything should be based on thinnest, not ap apical reading. And I say here again, there's no data to support this. I do not and have not used ultrasound pachymetry or placido pachymetry probably in, or placido topography probably in 20, 20 years. I use a minimal bed of 300 microns. I base it on the thinnest pachymetry. I, I have here, this is an old slide, I use the femtosecond setting plus two, two standard deviations. I will tell you now because I switched femtos that I use, I basically just use the femtosecond setting because the one I'm using now <clears throat> has a much tighter standard de 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 deviation. Um, so I use the thinnest pachymetry, I subtract the ablation, and I subtract the femtosecond setting, and I limit my residual bed to 300 microns. These are my general bad guidelines. It is age vary. As we all know, the risk is much less as we get older, but on patients under the age of 30, my upper limit normally is about 1.6 for a final D. Patients between 30 and 35, 1.8. 35 to 42.0. And again, this is ablation related. If someone comes in with a minus eight and they're at 1.8 and they're 30, I'm not gonna do it. Um, up to 2.2 in patients over 40, but I'm a little reluctant even on that. And we have very little data on patients over the age of 55, except that there's very little data on anyone over the age of 55 developing post-LASIK ectasia. So these are LASIK numbers. You can be more liberal in surface ablation, but again, these are general guide, guide, guidelines. So in summary, for the first part of this talk, the bad display allows a high specificity and sensitivity. I don't think additional testing with Placido is needed. I haven't used it in over two decades, but you need to use other information as we already alluded to, age, ablation depth, family history, stability of the exam, and remember to compare both eyes to asymmetry. If one eye is abnormal, the patient is abnormal. So I get a lot of requests, well, the right eye looks good, the left eye is abnormal, can I treat the right eye? The answer is no. And high asymmetry in itself should be a, a red flag. So that's the end of stage one. Why don't we kind of stand up for five minutes and we'll get into really what is some of the keratoconic work and the pro pro progression display. Do we have any questions on the first part? So either you're not interested or I was good. I think it's probably a little bit of both. So why don't we just take literally just five minutes. I'm gonna, I'm gonna get a quick drink and we'll just start, start up again. Okay, why don't, why don't we uh, restart because the first part took longer than I would have anticipated. The second part's gonna talk a little bit about the ABCD grading system. I'll go over that quickly. 
because I want to really get what I think is probably the most important thing and all kind of led into that, and that is the progression display. The progression display, the one that's currently available is an older version. I believe they're showing, they are showing the new version here at the, at the meeting. Um, have they released it yet? No. It's been available for a year. They haven't released it yet. Um, but it, it, is, it is on the Pentacam on, on, on the floor, correct? Because I, I did see it. So a lot of what we did was really to develop a new way to look at keratoconus. It's an inherent in interest of mine. And I've, I've always been kind of, I, I can't believe some of the things ophthalmology still uses or utilizes. Now, if you look at all these pictures, I'm guessing none of you use any of these devices any, any longer. But this is when the amsler krumach classification was developed. It was developed in 1947. It was based on two devices most of you no longer use. It was based on a keratometer. How many of you still have keratometers in, you, in your office? Very few. My residents don't even know how to use keratometers. And it was based on something I know none of you have, which is an optical picometer. So this was, it's a 70-year-old classification sy sy system. What are the limitations of amsler krumach One, it relies on apical thickness. So this eye here actually thins down to 499, but on amsler krumach it uses an apical reading, it's 520, but the biggest limitation, it completely ignores the posterior surface. So by amsler krumach this is a normal eye. This is not a normal eye. Notice it's a red here. It's an abnormal eye. It's a big prominent posterior ectasia, but if you classify this to an amsler krumach it's normal. But you will still go, and you will hear in this meeting, you will hear people still discuss, well, this is grade one, grade two, grade three, and it's really, it's a useless classification. Let's look at these two examples here. This is an 18-year-old with a pachymetry of 410, a mean K of 52, and an Rx of minus eight. So again, 18-year-old, 410, 52, minus eight. Here's a 47-year-old with a pachymetry of 544, a mean K of 48.5, and an Rx of 525. First of all, how many of you think these two are, are different? And how many of you would likely treat these diff differently? Well, according to amsler krumach they're graded exactly the same. This is stage two. So it really is a very useless class, class classification. What we needed, we needed a classification system that, that really recognizes our new ability to image the entire cornea. So we need a classification system that looks at not just the anterior surface, and again, amsler krumach just used a central K reading. We needed one to look at the posterior cornea, that looked not just at an apical reading, but the entire corneal thickness. We wanted to develop something that was relatively simple parameters that to some degree was platform independent as long as, a, as, long as it was a tom tomographic device and was able to convey clinically useful information. And the reason for that is Amsler Krumach was based when all we had was penetrating keratoplasty and contact lenses. And those two treatment modalities only come into play when you have advanced disease. You don't do a PK on someone with normal vision and subclinical keratoconus. So there was no reason to do anything other than looking at the anterior surface. You don't fit rigid contact lenses on someone with a good vision. But nowadays we have cross-linking and that's really the, the main thing where intervening at a much earlier stage is probably the most appropriate thing to do. So what we did, and the reason I gave you this big background on the enhanced reference surface is the enhanced reference surface works because when we remove that 3.5 millimeter zone, or I said it's really a, f a zone between three and four, we effectively remove the bulk of the cone. So we basically said, well, if that area that you remove effectively represents the bulk of the cone, rather than removing it, why don't we look at that? Because again, that will be, give us a representation of what the bulk of the cone is. So in the enhanced reference surface, we remove that area. But when we want to describe keratoconus, we said, okay, rather than looking at just a, a K reading, which is a single point, let's look at a global area that surrounds the thinnest point, which would give us better representation of the cone. And what we also had to do, even though most of us think in diopters, when you Think of both the anterior and posterior surface. Diopters is no longer intuitive. Because we all, if I say the cornea is 48 diopters, we kind of mentally know what that means. We can kind of convey a shape. 
but if I tell you the back surface is a minus seven diaptus, we have no idea what that really means because diaptus on the back surface is a low power negative lens because as opposed to the front surface, which is, I always get these mixed up, conve convex, the posterior surface is, nope, the other way around. Posterior surface is concave, I always get those mixed up, but as opposed to an air cornea interface, it's a cornea aqueous interface, so it's a low power, so diaptus is not intuitive. So optometrists are used to it, but radius of curvature is a much better way to describe because it actually describes the surface better. So we looked at the three millimeter zone surrounding the thinnest point of the cornea, both on the anterior surface, the posterior surface, and opposed to a, a apical reading, we looked at the thinnest cornea. And this will look very confusing, but it really is very simple because it's done automatically by, by the machine. We came up with what we call an A, B, C, D classification. A stands for the anterior surface, and what it's measuring is the anterior radius of curvature taken from a three millimeter optical zone surrounding the thinnest point of the cornea. B stands for back, which is the posterior radius of curvature, again, from a three millimeter zone taken at the thinnest point. C stood for corneal thickness, which is not an apical reading, again, but the thinnest. And D stood for distance, best spectacle, distance, vision cor correction. That's not something the machine puts in, but you as an operator have to, have to en enter. So again, we had A, B, C, D. The other thing <coughs> we added was a stage zero. If you think about Amsa Krumak, there is nothing that represents a normal eye. Everything is stage one or, or worse. So we added also something to more represent a more normal, a normal eye. <coughs> Excuse me a second. So as I said, <coughs> it sounds confusing, but it's really very easy. It's done automatically by the machine. This is something that could be available on any OCT or Shine Fluke. It's currently only available on, on the Pentacam. And it's part of what's called the topometric keratoconus staging. And it's this little part here, which I'll blow up on the next slide. So what it does, it tells you the absolute value of the anterior radius of curvature, which is 7.6 in this eye, the posterior radius of curvature, 4.82, the thinnest pachymetry, 381, and the distance vision to 2020. Why is the distance vision 2020? Because notice the A parameter, the anterior surface, is completely normal. But notice the B parameter, it's actually off the scale. This is a huge posterior ectasia a thin cornea, but normal vision because the anterior surface is normal. This is, again, is subclinical disease, but true disease. So this would be classified A0. I would know immediately I have a normal anterior surface, B4, marked posterior ectasia, C3, moderately thin cornea, but a normal dis 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 distance vis vis visual acuity. So let's look at a couple quick examples. This is a normal eye. This is a format picture. This is a topometric keratoconus and it's blown up here and you'll notice everything is completely zero. So it's a completely normal eye. Here is one with very early ectatic change. You can notice you can pick up the very early positive island of elevation here, more prominently on the posterior surface. And you'll notice again here, we have a scale of A1, B0, C0, D1. But notice if you look at the scale, we're just about past the one point on all of these. And here's more advanced keratoconus. I don't think anyone would miss the ectasia on the anterior surface and posterior surface, but again, you'll see the grading system here. So this represents the actual radius of curvature. This is the grading, and this is the graphical representation of the grading. And here's advanced keratoconus. You'll notice it's off the scale on both the anterior surface and the post posterior surface. Interesting, but the real goal of developing that was to try to develop a way to determine when and if we have true progression of d disease. So again, we need, as I said earlier, we need the ability to identify ectatic disease earlier than was previously required because basically of cross-linking. We need a better way to classify the disease severity that represents all the anatomical letters, layers, but we need to know when and if true progression occurs, and that's really a key. So in order to do that, utilizing the ABCD, we needed to determine when we had statistically significant change in these parameters. So to, 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 to do that, we had to determine the inherent noise measurement of these. In other words, if you get on a scale every single day, 
and use the same scale, you may vary a pound or two because that's the normal inherent noise level of, of that scale. But what you want to know is do you gain weight or lose weight, you have to determine what the normal noise level of that measurement. So we also decided it was important to study two different pop populations, a normal population and an abnormal or a keratoconic population. Does anyone know where this picture is from? Someone knows, yes. Young, young Frankenstein, yes. Um, and that's ab, ab, Abby Normal. Um, and the reason we did that to determine noise levels for both a normal and abnormal keratoconic population is because in your very young patients or the patients with subclinical disease, very mild disease, the noise level in those probably more closely mimic a normal pop population. And the patient with more advanced keratoconus, the noise levels in those will have to be measured against a keratoconic population. All of you probably know on almost any test you do, if you have an abnormal patient, the noise levels are inherently greater in those. Um, if you just do keratometry or any, any placido or any OCT or Scheinflug on someone with advanced keratoconus, those measurements are inherently more, more noisy. So again, as he said here, the reason to study both is for the older patient with clinically evident disease, the noise levels from the keratoconic database are probably more appropriate. Additionally, the older patient is less likely to have rapid change, so waiting is a little bit, a little bit more uh, appropriate. But the young patient or the patient with very early disease where the goal is to preserve and not lose vision, their measurements more closely mimic a normal pop population. Additionally, the risk of waiting in a young patient is, is greater. So what we found is exactly what you would expect and that is the keratoconic patients are noisier than the normal pop populations. And we, de we determined an 80 and 95 one-tail confidence interval. One-tail confidence interval because we looked at the data and analyzed it only on one side. In other words, if you're looking at thickness, we're only concerned if a cornea gets thinner. If you're looking at anterior elevation or anterior curvature or posterior elevation, posterior curvature, we're only interested if it gets more ectatic or, or more, more steep. So we looked at, again, what is the noise level, and we call it a, a one-tail confidence interval, and we determined both an 80 and 95% confidence interval. And if you look, it's exactly what you would think. The keratoconic population here, this is the anterior rates of curvature, this is the 95% confidence interval, much greater than the normal population. Here's the post posterior, again, greater than the normal. Here's thickness all across the board. The keratoconic population, as we expect, is a noisier measurement. And this was the original display that is, was a, uh, the original one that we released. And what it does, it allows you to graphically display each of the four A, B, C, D parameters with up to eight exams over time. It displays them against both the 80 and 95% confidence interval on a normal and keratoconic pop population. In addition, it allows you to put in when and if you've done a cross-linking treatment, and then what your baseline ex exam is. And this will be much easier to see on the new display, which I'll show you shortly. The data is the same, it's just a much easier display to, to, to see. Additionally, we list a number of other parameters that people have looked at that are important in determining treatment and or pro pro progression. So here we show age of the patient. Here again is the A parameter, the B parameter, the C and D, distance visual acuity. Here's the final D from the bad display, the progression index average, ART max. Here's K max. These are two Q values, and these are anterior parameters that uh, are also available on the Pentacam. So basically almost any parameter that people have really used, but the display was really designed to really show you visually whether you have progressive disease or not. Again, this is a blow up of this, that, of, of the tab, tabular form of all the other parameters. But I wanna show you now the new display because it's much easier to see, much easier to explain. So again, it allows you to display up to eight exams over time. So here, this is an example, this is the A parameter, and you'll notice here over time it's displaying what the A parameter is doing. The green represents the normal population, so this would be an 80% confidence interval, which is hatched. 
The solid represents a 95% confidence interval. The red is the keratoconic population. Here's 80% and here is 95%. So if I was to look at this person, and this is over a period of, a relatively short period of time, about two, two years. There's been not a huge amount of change in the A parameter, but notice from exam one to exam two, the A parameter has changed past the 95% confidence interval of all, the, all both the normal and keratoconic population. If I look at the posterior surface, same thing. It's changed up to the 80%, and if I look at corneal thickness, it's dramatically changed past the 95%. Notice that then treatment was done here. This is that hash line, and these are the follow-ups post-treatment. But let's look at some clinical examples here. So this is a 15-year-old with advanced keratoconus, seven-year follow-up. So we are able to retrospectively go back. So these are some patients that had this been available earlier, we would have intervened, but so this is a 15-year-old with a seven-year follow-up. Notice again, over that entire seven years, progressive change both on the anterior surface, dramatic change on the posterior surface, and change on the corneal thickness. There's no visual acuity because, like I said, visual acuity is operator entered, and this, this physician did not put in visual acuity. But again, here is a 15-year-old that, had this been available, should have had inter intervention much, much earlier. If we... But this now will really show you the advantage of using this display. This is a 15-year-old with very early keratoconus, 13-month follow-up. I, bl I blew up what the K-max is over the three exams, 46.1, 45.5, 45.8. No significant change at all in K-max, which is what many people use to determine whether to treat a person or not. And if we look at the anterior surface, absolutely no, no change. But look at the posterior cornea. From here to here, well past, this is the 80%, by the third exam, well past the 95% confidence interval. This person has progressive disease in spite of a completely stable K-max. If this was a 15-year-old in my practice that I've, I've seen this change, I would intervene immediately. Now, many people, depending on where you are geographically, routinely treat keratoconic patients in, in, in their teens, um, but that varies ge ge geographically. But if you look really at this classification on first one, it's everything is zero. This is very, very early disease, but statistically significant progressive disease on the posterior surface. Here is an 18-year-old, again, stable K-max, 48.6, 48.4 on one eye, 46.244 actually got better on the second eye, but again, let's look what's going on. The anterior surface, no significant change. This eye has changed just at the 95% confidence interval on the back surface, corneal thickness at the 80%, but look what's going on on this eye, well past on the posterior surface. Again, stable K-max, no change in vision, progressive disease in an 18-year-old. Eight, this is a patient with advanced keratoconus. So the bad D, if you look over here, the bad D values are all over seven. So this represents advanced disease. But again, to show you, it's advanced disease, but a stable anterior surface. Notice this is the anterior surface. Nothing approaches even the 80% confidence interval. So this is a, an older person. I don't know the age of this person off the top of my head. But this is someone who, even though they had relatively advanced keratoconus, if they weren't progressing, we probably would not treat. And if you, all you had were K readings or placido, this person is completely stable. If you look at the K readings here, they haven't really budged. But look what's going on again on the back and corneal thick thickness reading. Progressive disease. So again, the progression display allows you to pick up progressive disease earlier than traditionally been, been allowed to and allows you also to look at progressive disease in spite of sometimes a completely stable K-max. Now here's the last example of a case I'm going to show you. This is a case post-LASIK. Patient comes in with uncorrected visual acuity complaints, so decrease in uncorrected visual acuity. K-max of 49.1. And this is the map that shows a positive ion level elevation. Anyone want to throw out what they think is going on? OK, 
Okay, so post post LASIK, steep caves, de decreased vision, and this is the, the map. So this is actually a patient who's post hyperopic LASIK. Okay, so those caves are normal. This map is a normal post hyperopic LASIK. How do you determine post hyperopic LASIK, post LASIK ectasia? Very difficult. Again, this is a normal curvature map on a, on a post hyperopic cornea. This would be a normal pachymetric map. This is the ele elevation map. This is the posterior elevation map. How do you determine it? Look at this eye. Well, we're seeing some changes on the anterior surface. Look what's going on in the posterior surface on that patient when we follow that person over time. You should not see changes on the posterior surface post LASIK. We don't alter the posterior surface. Though this person had hyperopic LASIK, which is very difficult to determine post LASIK ectasia on if you're only looking at the anterior surface, it was very clear by even the second exam that this person had progressive ectasia and was treated. So how do we diagnose progression of keratoconus? Again, we recognize now that the dissociation between the clinical progression, in other words, K-max decreased vision, and true progression, which can be on the posterior surface. We should really utilize a tomographic base classification system that recognizes and measures all the anatomical levels. And again, a tomographic based progression display that documents when we do get statistically significant change. And for those who are interested in cross-linking, there is a big meeting coming up in December in Zurich. And we're pretty much finished four minutes on time, ahead of time. So I know no one had any, but anyone have any questions at all? This is the guy who knew Mount Everest height, but go ahead. What, you want to go up to the mic, because I don't know if everyone. Uh, the ABC criteria, um, uh, those are based on the central three millimeters. Not the, the central. Apex, the, 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 around the thinnest, the thinnest point, point, right? Yes. That's what it's based yes. on. Yeah. Um, did you derive those criteria using uh, receiver operator characteristics? What, what were the categories based on? Because When you uh, say based on, are you talking about where we develop the patient or how we develop well, the numbers? Yes, the, the categories, because you, you replace the old system with five categories and... Well, our, our ROC is different. This, these are strictly based on mean and stand deviations of that population. So, so ROCs would be fitting something. That's how you would determine whether something's applicable to apply. But this is purely a, uh, it's an average uh, population-based study. But, but the, for the A, B, C, D, the stage one, stage oh, two, oh, stage oh, okay, three, okay. stage sorry, four. Sorry, 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 sorry. Okay, so what we did, um, you know what, I, it may be, I don't know if it's, it shows on that slide because I skipped over it real quickly. But what we did is, I understand exactly what we did is we took the Amsler Crumac classification because people are, are used to, to, to the Amsler Crumac. We took what Amsler Crumac broke down for stage one, two, three, and four. We changed it only, it's only the anterior surface because that's all it measured. We changed their numbers into radius of curvature. We then looked at our numbers, mean stand deviation, and we said, okay, if we use the Amsler Crumac numbers, what would that be? And then we applied that standard deviation across the board for both anterior, posterior, and corneal thickness. And I don't know if I'm gonna show that on the slide. Yeah, so what you did is here, these are, we basically took stage one, two, three, and four of AMS Crumac because people are used to that gradation. We convert it to radius of curvature and said, okay, if we use those numbers, what would the mean standard deviation of that bracket be? We then use that standard deviation across the board uh, for A, B, C, and D, and then we added zero, which is off the scale. Does that make sense? What we well, you're, you're actually degrading a continuous scale to a, 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 a 
well, brackets. You, well, well and, that's and correct. I was it's, just it, wondering if no, there was any, but, any rationale to that yes, or not. Yes, that's why I say this is really the description of a cornea right here. Okay, yes. This is strictly a grading. But grading system does exactly that. The only reason to do a grading system is because people do studies and they say, okay, we hear it all along. People will go, well, I treat my grade three keratoconus with rings and grade four with, so that's just a grading to do. You're correct. This is the description of the cornea right here. Mm -hmm. And if I'm, I said, this is the actual description of what the cornea is. This is a graphical display. This is strictly a grading or classification of grouping. Correct. Yeah, so it's, it's arbitrary. It's arbitrary. Everything, yes. Just like, you know, when you take your, I'm going to break you down, people who weigh 100 and less, 100 to 120, 120, 140, yeah, it's an arbitrary. But the actual weight of the person is the weight of the person. Because with your first category on A, if you have a, a complete separation between your 95% uh, interval for normals and your 80% interval for keratoconus, so that would have a, a high ROC uh, discrimination between normal and keratoconus. So that's why I was wondering, what wouldn't it be better to move towards a... a, a, a oh, a, the, a the, the gates are not based on, the, on, on this. The gates are based on these numbers. The, this is strictly, as you say, it's a grouping. Yes. Yes. Yeah, the grouping doesn't pertain to the 80 and 95% confidence intervals. Well, that, that was more, more clear to me than, okay. than these grading systems. Thank you. Yeah, the grade, and that's why I kind of said, if you remember, I started saying, I'm going to go over this quickly because it really was developed for a progression display. Yeah, and as I said, I usually, this is what describes the cornea. Any other questions? Yes, if, uh, oh, sure. yep. So I, I know that you mentioned uh, the uh, availability of cross-linking will depend on the geographical location. Uh, what is your threshold for starting the treatment? So I would like to know what is your practice and how frequent do you scan uh, keratoconic patients because this is uh, completely variable across the world. Yeah, I, I, I almost will not answer just because it is so variable. <laughs> in, in the Middle East, you have a, the rate of progression is so different that the, the normal practice there, and I would agree with it, if you identify true disease in a child, you treat the child. Um, the U.S., that may be what we should be doing also, but we're restricted by um, basically most insurance companies will not approve treatment unless we show them progressive progression based on old FDA one diopter K-max change or not. And we're all fighting that. But it really varies greatly by one, geography, because the nature of the disease is very different elsewhere, um, and also what the coverage is, and also realize that you'll cringe, but the U.S. has one device approved, and the um, riboflavin cost us nearly $3,000 a patient. So there's a lot of impediments for us treating. Thank you. Thank you, thank, thank you all very much, and I appreciate you staying to the end. Thank, thank you.